What's up, everybody? It's your favorite YouTubers, Universal Theory. We're going to be talking about your favorite topic today, quantum entanglement. It's definitely the most misinformed <laughs> uh, topic that I've, that I've came across in the mystical community, not necessarily as much in the scientific. And when I say that, I just mean the way that individuals use it. They're using the, the concept they might be talking about is right, but then when they go and apply quantum entanglement to it, it's like, oh, man, you screwed it up. That's not what entanglement it is, silly. Mm. <laughs> At least not in the scientific sense. So yeah, that's what we do, right? We're going to be talking about the science, and then Jordan's going to apply a couple principles. We'll both be applying you know, uh, what we know about the principles to this because we want to activate the left brain and the right brain to induce holistic thinking. Whether you are a scientist watching this or you are a, uh, you know, a, a mystic watching this, whatever you want to call yourself, then what you want to be is both. And we're going to try to help you accomplish that because these two things are, they seem so separate, but they are so close. And the fact that one stimulates one side of the brain, one stimulates the other side of the brain. Shout out to my coworker, Chris, who told me that, hey, when you get your PhD, it's philosophy I doctor, or it, that's the Latin. And, and I'm, pardon me if I butchered it, but it's, you know, the translation is doctor of philosophy. And as we know, what does philosophy stand for? In uh, in in Latin, philosophia, which is wisdom, right? Or the the love, love of wisdom. The love of wisdom. So yeah, I see. I tested you there. The love the love of wisdom. No, I thought of it after I said that. Um, so the love of wisdom is philosophy, people, and that's what we're that's what we have. We have the love of wisdom. When you get your doctorate, you have the love of wisdom. And philosophy is what we're trying to combine with science. You can't tell me that's a coincidence. I'm not listening. <laughs> so please, you know, uh, continue to work with us. Continue to work with yourselves. Continue to see these patterns. Continue to understand that these are t these are two of the same. Thanks, Chris, for that for that comment in the on the, on the videos. We 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 appreciate the the little bits of knowledge that you drop for us. So, quantum entanglement. What's happening with quantum entanglement is you have you can create a, a pair of entangled photons essentially by putting it down a certain you know having it interact with a certain crystal and it will cause the photon you don't double the energy but the photons will become entangled essentially it creates two and then it's an entangled pair now and they're each half of the energy because as, we, as we've talked about energy is conserved so now we have these photons that are entangled. Right, so we had one that came down, it went through a crystal, and now we have this entangled pair. And okay, what's so special about that? Well, what's so special about that is they can move along their own trajectories now, and once we measure one of them, the other one collapses into its state simultaneously. This is there is no at the speed of light, and no, this is one of this is one of the hardest things that it took for for me after learning special relativity for two, three years mm. for, to start trying to understand that how does something move faster than the speed of light? How does inf information? And then it was information doesn't mm. the in, There is no information. And this is where, it, this is really what cleared it up for me. So hopefully this clears it up for you at home. If you're still kind of uh, trying to understand this quantum entanglement idea, people are just spouting nonsense. What What's really, What's really, yeah, sorry, I have a bit of disdain for this because of how often it's been misused. I, sh I need to work through that. That's my trauma. I'm sorry if I'm projecting my trauma. But the, the, what really brought it home for me is, okay, because this is a 50-50 shot, let's just say of this photon having a, a, a being polarized spin up or spin down, and this one spin up. That means this one spin down. If I, in any way, with any technology, could, uh, could, could know that this was going to be spin up or spin down, whatever it's going to be, with a higher certainty than 50%, now we're getting somewhere, right? Now we could start to build technology because it's like, oh, we could just send a bunch. And if we know, we could, if we send it through this apparatus, it's going to have a 65% of being spin up. Mm. So we know these ones are going to be spin down. Then it's like, wow, we're opening up a whole new level of information transfer, but that's not what happens, and we're not there yet. We might get there through cause and effect, right? That principle says mm. that at some point, maybe man will get to that point of understanding what it's going to be. But as of right now, the fact that I know that it's up, even if I could, as soon as I know that it's up, I have a camera on my head. 
that has fiber optic 5G that's going to, you know, someone else's computer across the world and telling them, hey, your photon is spin down. It's going to be spin down already, right? Because mm. my information of me telling that other scientist has to move along light, right? Mm. Optic cables or, or electrons or however you want to say it. It's that information is bound by the speed of light. So quantum entanglement isn't, it's not breaking any rules, but non-locality. Mm. There is this idea, we are starting to understand that this information the attributes of the energy don't have to exist within the energy. That's what non-local means. It means these attributes are existing outside of the localized energy. And mm. to me, that is the most fascinating part of quantum entanglement. And that is, you know, the Nobel Prize that was big on TikTok, how these people got it for finding out about non-locality. Uh, it, like, uh, it was the last one. It was last year's. Mm -hmm. It was 2020, 2022's Nobel Prize. And this non-local environment just means that these attributes don't have to exist where the energy is. Mm. Yeah, so applying mentalism to them, you think, you know, the all is mind, the universe is mental. Every part of this all mind is infinite and is the center of itself. So this is this whole concept in metaphysics where the now, mm -hmm. you know, past, present, and future are a singularity and living in mm. the now is non-local mm. because the now is everywhere. So space and time are a non-locality in that sense. Mm -hmm. So from an absolute standpoint, you're absolutely correct. Um, from a relative standpoint, we still have relativity. Mm -hmm. We still have general relativity and we still have special relativity. Even though I'm not necessarily referring to that when I say relative, I just mean everything is relative. <laughs> yeah. But we still have those things. So, you know, it's like we're a long ways off from figuring out how to, you know, build a ship for one, you know, an interstellar spacecraft. Oh, and, yeah. and then... Uh, you know, instantaneously send it to the other side of the universe because there is no there is no difference between this location and the next. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's it's all fine and dandy in theory. I mean, well, you know, it, with the math being there, but you know, let's practically figuring it out is an entirely different uh, thing. But but it's also a reality. You know, we can prove that non locality is real. Like you said, they just got a Nobel uh, Prize for it, and we see that. You know, once you observe these entangled particles, mentalism, the all is mind, the universe is mental, now you understand the polarity of the opposing particle. Mm -hmm. Because if this one's spin up, the other one is spin down, we don't know if it's spin up or spin down until we observe it. Like he said, it's not like we can navigate it with uh, anything more than a 50% accuracy. Mm hmm um, which is not necessarily going to help us if we're in the middle of space and, and we need some, we need some practical technology they're just going to be out there. It's like, are they alive or dead? There's a 50% yeah. chance. Yeah. They're in a state of superposition. Right yeah. Now. They might as well be Schrodinger's cat <laughs> yeah. at that point. Um, but you know, on the bright side of things, we could think, you know, because like I said, the all is mind, the universe is mental, and we're talking about polarity, and these principles do apply absolutely to the relative, and they have proven that these things are real. Now it's time to, you know, to figure out how to navigate it, but let's hypothesize a little bit. So how about if energy could be exchanged, we're, we're not talking about it from a linear standpoint since it happens instantaneously. Right. We're talking about a non-local attribute of the universe and energetic uh, or informational transference. So maybe energy is being transferred through uh, the field, but we don't know how to use the field to our advantage yet where we can send information in that way. And some of the people in the comments are saying, okay, this is a bit crazy, but you know that's what that's – what, scientists do they do crazy stuff and then you know they're either right or they're wrong but i, I would say in my opinion the the, the most um a, you know the most accurate assessment would would be it's most likely information traveling through the field but like i said it's not it's not a practical science yeah. for one and then for two you know how would we access it Right. And how and, and, and then what, you know, what could we do with it? Like I said, and metaphys metaphysicians are like, well, what about telepathy? And, you know, what about, you know, 
I'm thinking of somebody and then this person uh, comes to my house or whatever, you know what I mean? Uh, coincidences. I don't believe in coincidences. You're right. And maybe that is how information happens telepathically. Maybe information is traveling through the field. But the, the point that, you know, like with him, you know, being frustrated uh, with and being traumatized by uh, the metaphysical community is because there's too many of us just taking this leap of faith and just calling it something that it may or may not be. You know, it's like, oh, that was quantum entanglement. It's like, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But if it is, how is the information being exchanged? Mm -hmm. We can't just leap and just say that it's happening in a specific way when we don't know specifically. And that's the point of merging these two hemispheres and these two different uh, opposing, uh, apparently opposing ways of thinking of things, unifying them is so that if you do have a genius idea and you're like, hey, this is how telepathy works, it's quantum entanglement, the information's being exchanged via the field, then, you know, get a laboratory, get some uh, funding and do the research and figure it out so that we can actually send information to other extraterrestrial communities that distant galaxies or yeah. we can build some type of technological devices that we could use practically it's like if, if you're the genius that's going to help us get to the star trek level right now hey you know i salute you but you're going to have to do some research and you can't just hypothesize and expect people you know in the scientific community to just agree with you and you know say hey you're in and celebrate you as a genius like no. all the geniuses in the scientific community had to work their asses off for many, many, many years in their careers to get to a point where they finally get this Nobel Prize. These dudes didn't just say, hey, Buddha said everything is non-local, so <laughs> the universe is non-local. They had to, you know, spent years yeah. studying math and physics to figure out how to validate this premise. Yeah, respecting the grind mm -hmm. and understanding that, hey, most of the theoretical physicists are these philosophers like we've talked about. That's what they're doing. They're the ones that are saying these kind of outlandish things and then experimental physicists catch up. Mm. But what they don't tell you is how many ideas that they had that were wrong. I think that's a big misconception. Yes. A lot of these theoretical physicists have dozens, if not hundreds of ideas that experimental physicists work towards that are wrong. So just because you postulate it, just because you say, Hey, these two things make sense because of the principles doesn't mean the way you're thinking of it is right. Mm -hmm. whether you're using the hermetic principles or you're using the scientific method. Yes. And either way, if you are right or not, but if you are right, then, you know, because I'm not taking shots at anybody's religion. One sure. of my best friends is a practicing Buddhist. Um, but what I'm saying is, and he'll even say this, you know, you have practicing Buddhist monks, Zen masters and so forth, Taoist, Rosicrucians, Kabbalists who study physics, who study science, who mm -hmm. study math, because they know that, you know, hypothesizing or even having the experience yourself, it may be tangible evidence for you, but what use is it if it's only practical for you? and not everyone else. Like, what is the point? What are, why are we doing this? We're doing this so that everybody can use it, not just a, a one person or a small group of select individuals who had this rare experience that they can't validate scientifically and share with the rest of the world. We're trying to unify these two different uh, opposing ways of looking at the universe so that everyone can use this science in the future.